Okay, so anyway, Alessandro Chiodo is gonna talk about how to draw the Sri Yantra with pencils and conics. So let's welcome him. Thanks, yeah. Sebastian, and thanks, Andre, or Andres, for, uh, for inviting me here and for giving me this opportunity to give this very uh, unusual talk. Uh, unusual for me, and I suppose for you too. And uh, so this is about uh, a symbol. Uh, maybe a, a symbol that fits in the context of yantras. So what are yantras? Yantra is not such a sacred uh, word. Uh, it can be also used uh, in order to define some instrument, uh, astronomical instruments, uh, surgical instruments. So it may actually just mean instrument uh, in some sense. It's a, it's a graphic support here. It's a graphic support that in this context is uh, used for uh, meditation. It's a, it's a, it's a, the one we're going to talk about today is this. It's called the, the Sri Yantra or Sri Yantra. It's sometimes it's transliterated differently with an S, H. And uh, it's, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sacred symbol of Hinduism, of a, one tradition called uh, uh, Tantric Hinduism or at least in the Western world, so called in this way. And uh, so we're going to, to say a few words about where it comes from, but not much. Not only because I'm not habilitated to give a talk on this, but also because the origins are not known. We do not know when the symbol was made in the first place. So I, I started from a... a um, solid fact that uh, is uh, said in this way by Gérard Huet, someone who ro ro wor worked on this uh, symbol for, for some time. And uh, he concludes one of the papers uh, about the geometry of the Sri Yantra by saying this, although it is uh, hinted in several sources that this symbol is very old, the author does not know of any published representation anterior to the 17th century, leaving open its date of creation. On the other hand, if you just Google, you will find plenty of people uh, claiming that uh, the origins of the symbol are extremely ancient. And indeed, uh, if we take a different point of view and we do not search for a material realization of the symbol, but actually for some verses that uh, seem to speak about, uh, about the symbol, then we actually can find uh, some uh, frequently quoted uh, and uh, uh, verses that are considered uh, to uh, uh, be extremely ancient and that uh, uh, seem to describe with very little possibilities of mistakes the same symbol. So let, look at this translation of uh, some uh, Sanskrit uh, verses. Um, they, this, this says, the Sri Yantra of the Supreme Deity consists of a Bindu a bindu is a dot or a, or a drop, if you want. So it's a central spot that you uh, find in the middle of the symbol, surrounded by a, a triangle, and then uh, enclosures formed by 8, 10, and then again 10, 14 triangles. We're going to detail this, but indeed this is what you find. If you, if you, if you look at all these disjoint triangles that you find in the symbol, then indeed you can count uh, these uh, 8, 10, 10, and 14 triangles inside of it. And so this ancient uh, uh, quote uh, seem indeed to, seems indeed to, to speak about this symbol. And um, again, other ways to approach this question of the origin is to trace, it, trace them back in ancient rituals. There has been a symposium uh, organized by the CNRS in Paris in 1984 on uh, mantras and uh, yantras uh, and Tara Mikhail. Uh, is uh, one of the author of a paper that describes a tradition of ritual use taken from uh, a uh, hymn which is called the Wave of Beauty, the San Saundarya Laharia, excuse myself for this pronunciation, and uh, another, another famous text called uh, The Heart uh, of the, the Yogini. This um, 
is by André Padou and is uh, one of the most complete uh, translation and uh, account uh, of uh, uh, this uh, text and again makes references to usages of the symbol and describes the symbol in the same in, in uh, ways that uh, seem to lead to the same uh, to, to identify the Sri Yantra. So this is all I want to say about the origins. It's a completely open subject, the subject of uh, studies uh, by uh, people in the field and uh, sometimes we find sentences like this that add to the to the fascination that people have toward the symbol. Uh, in, this, uh, in, uh, in this book, The Tantric Way, uh, by Mukherjee and, and uh, Kana, one can find a sentence which is irresistible to quote. The Sri Antra in its formal contest is a visual masterpiece of abstraction and must have been created through revelation rather than by human ingenuity and craft. Okay, so let's, let's try and, uh, and uh, understand what it is. And uh, we, we look at it first. Of course, it is a complex uh, structure. It's, it starts with, uh, with, a, with a square that surrounds it. The square is a uh, thing called the Bupura. It represents the earth, then a, a triple circle, then uh, 16 petals of lotus, and then uh, eight petals of lotus. But uh, now we're interested in uh, what happens in the middle of this uh, symbol, which is a circle, which is circumscribed uh, around the polygon. And uh, if we follow the quote that I just uh, have given before, uh, one way to describe what happens is just to take the bindu, as I do here, place it uh, in the middle of the picture, then place a triangle around it. And then, as I said, we start with uh, a sequence of eight triangles that we place carefully so that they touch the vertices of the triangle in this way, and then a sequence of 10 triangles, then again a sequence of 10 triangles more, and finally the sequence of 14 triangles. This, I hope, explains what this verse that I quoted before says. And another classical way of seeing this, before getting to some formal description, is to look at the symbol as a superposition of triangles. Not disjoint triangles, but the nine triangles, five pointing downwards and four, four pointing upwards, that are uh, placed one on top of the other in this careful way, in such a way that, uh, well, some concurrences are respected. And uh, as you see, I have some hesitation placing them. But, uh, you know, this is a nice game you can play with, with uh, children and uh, eventually forming this symbol. So, so as you can see, alternatively, I place upward triangles and downward triangles. It's a good time to spot, uh, to, to, to mention that uh, all uh, vertices uh, of uh, downward triangles touch a basis of, a, of an upward triangle, except, to, except from uh, the two last uh, triangles I will place, which touch uh, the two highest and lowest point of the, the circle. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, one description of it. And I would like to get to some uh, formal uh, description, but before that, I would like to play a little bit in order to see, or this, this is what I made. I mean, I decided I was going to give a talk about this, and I thought, uh, still, it's hard to give a definition of the symbol. I don't, I mean, uh, one way one can go about it is to describe it explicitly, say exactly what each triangle does, which vertex goes to what, and uh, which concurrency is made. It's going to make a long list, which is going to be hard to, to, uh, to, uh, to detail and maybe very boring. Okay, so since I don't want to bore anybody, uh, let's, uh, let's try and, uh, and, uh, and see what, what is so difficult and what is so complicated about this symbol. So I will, uh, I will uh, ridicule myself and try and, and make this drawing. Okay? So I, I start from um, the Bindu, and uh, all along this vertical axis, I, I will place a triangle. So let's see if I make a triangle correctly. OK, so this should be an isosceles triangle. So let's, uh, let's make it into an isosceles triangle. So when I make an isosceles triangle, let's take a, a, a red 
in a red pen. I may actually notice that an isosceles triangle depends on, the, on this data. As long as I have, we all agree that uh, we stayed on the, this vertical axis, these are the three parameters. which I have placed to start with. Of course, up to rescaling and translation, I can say that there is only one parameter, but uh, let's, let's not rescale and translate for a while. And, uh, and then, then I would like to, to write the first, uh, the first structure around. So every time I add two more triangles, one pointing up and one pointing down. So, and uh, if I have some uh, external vertex available, I will lean on them. Okay? And so, if I do not, I will need to use some more degrees of freedom. And uh, one more thing, the earliest triangle, the earliest triangle that I have been uh, making is going to raise a little bit in order to be able to... Okay, so this is the, the first step, right? I've surrounded this by this, by this uh, eight new triangles, but I have to point out that uh, some new choices have been made. Where did I place this? It was a free choice. Also, where did I place this? It was a free choice. Where did I place this was a free choice. And another free choice was this one. So we have four more parameters. And okay, so starting from this, this is actually a symbol. In itself, it's a yantra that is famous in other contexts. It's going to be often used in many constructions in Hinduism. Now you can see, see that uh, my degrees of freedom start uh, being less and less in number. You can see that uh, if I lean on the external vertices, I do not have many more possibilities to expand. Here, for example, for this stage, I've used one more degree of freedom, which is the spot. But okay, so not starting from now, everything is going to be determined. Uh, let me just complete. As I, as I said, uh, after, after doing this, the initial triangles, the initial downward and the initial upward triangle, are going to be extended to subsume the lowest vertex. As you can see, I have made uh, all the steps needed to, oops, all the steps needed to draw the beginning. It's a bit like uh, defining a, a, a sequence and having the first step of the sequence. And from now on, everything is going to be fully determined. I'm going to lean on these vertices and then uh, on these. And uh, maybe I should be honest about this, but... Uh, and then form new, new stages of this. In order not to confuse people, I've decided to leave this there. Because as you can see, as I discover by doing this, it's not so easy to go on a blackboard and, and, and completely paint this. Nevertheless, it's still not clear where is the problem, right? I mean, uh, uh, we can go on like that, and where do we go? Where, where, do we, where are we getting by doing this? Well, let me, first of all, comment once again that this figure that I have put on the blackboard depends on eight parameters. So, of course, these this parameters are uniquely their place are uniquely determining the shape of this initial picture. So this is a picture which has a, a model A space, as we would say, of dimension eight. 
So that's a starting point. And from now on, everything is going to be determined by leaning on the external vertices. So here I was trying to skip through this, but I've already discussed this. I discussed that initially there was a downward triangle. This downward triangle got a little bit bigger, but preserved its shape. And two more triangles were added, one downward and one upwards. And then, uh, and then the, the first added downward triangle got a little bit bigger. Same with the first upward triangle. And the two new triangles were added by a systematic uh, game, leaning on some new degree of freedom. And eventually, eventually we have a structure which is completely determined and we can go on out, uh, independently. So that's what I do here, using not my hands, but some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, computer. I, uh, I say that starting from this point, the pattern is uh, completely determined. So I lean on the external vertices. I subsume the lowest and the uppest vertex, and I get this. And then it grows again. And then you get this. And then it grows again. It grows a bit too much. And it degenerates. Eventually, the, the, this pattern is doomed to produce something that contracts vertically and expands, expands way too much horizontally. So let's step back to the last step and uh, remove some corner. And uh, the three entree is simply this, or would like, I would like this to be this. I mean a diagram that I obtained by stepping back at the very last step, removing some corners, and I require that this is inscribed within a circle. So here are the questions. Oh, wait. I, in, in doing this, I, I wondered whether this game could go on forever. Of course, it's, it's possible that we work on a different metric space and, uh, and we can trace triangles forever. And in fact, uh, it turns out that, that there are some versions of this yantra which are called uh, turtle, which are, which are uh, kurma uh, yantras that are made on, uh, on, a, the, on the shell of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a turtle. And so, uh, in that case, I will allow myself not to draw a straight line, but, uh, but to, to bend uh, according to some uh, metric which I choose, choose uh, conveniently so that this, uh, this pattern can go on and on and on. I did that because I think that, to us at least, this way of picturing things is immediately is much more explicit or much better than a definition, right? If I give you a definition of this pattern, it's hard to read in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, immediately here during the talk. But if you, if you see how this has been growing and how this leads to a figure where we find inside the same structure that uh, we started from and it can go on growing forever. Okay, so this is just a side remark because indeed our problem was not that. This is the problem that we have to solve. The problem is inscribing this polygon within a circle, or more precisely, uh, well, making this uh, circle be the circumscribed circle of the two biggest triangle. So the two biggest triangles should have the share the same circumscribed circle. Now, as you know, a triangle has only one circle that is circumscribed to it, and we are re requiring it to to coincide. We want this two circles to have the same center and the same radius. So this is, a, this is gonna cost us something. It's gonna cost us two degrees of freedom. We're gonna got, get down from this eight degrees of freedom to some two, uh, six parameter space if everything goes well. Or maybe, maybe, maybe we're lucky and everything works, but we know that it doesn't work all the time because we already seen an example of something going off the mark. But actually another question could be, is it possible to, to fit this diagram inside the circle? And the answer is given by the three entry himself that comes and say, yes, it's possible. Although, one, to be honest, should uh, be able to, to uh, prove it. Because uh, this solution uh, is based on a, a handmade one. And uh, as you can see, it's not a precise one. So one, one should actually make an argument to, to claim that it's possible to at least uh, get one precise answer. And so, and so I think I have conveyed the message 
that there is some difficulty here. Not maybe a difficulty that we're not going to be able to, to understand, but it's going to be a good excuse to spend the rest of the time that we have to speak about uh, some conics and some algebraic geometry or even some geometry in general. Uh, but just a little look at what has been done so far. Uh, there is a relatively recent, uh, uh, I mean, not as ancient as the quotes that are made on the blackboard before, commentator of this uh, uh, sacred, uh, of, this, uh, of this hymn called the Saundaria Lahari. I haven't mentioned this. This, this uh, wave of beauty hymn is uh, actually uh, attributed to an 8th century philosopher, a very important one called Adi Shankara. And uh, in a commentator to, his, to, to this, uh, this uh, commentator provides just a set of coordinates. He just uh, fixes some units. I don't know if there are 32 or I don't remember. But then in the, in the end, he made, may, manages to convey us at least a shape by, by some. Of course, the shape is not precise. If you, I don't know if you can see it from yourself, but this, this is not concurrent. But at least there is one place where you can say here is the definition. We understand what he means. And there, more recently, in the 70s, the, the, these people, Bolton and McLeod, have given a, what we more or less have done on that blackboard, uh, some set of concurrencies and uh, yielding to the question that we have just stated. So we have some concurrencies, and then we draw some uh, lines uh, that lean on uh, these vertices and that vertices, and then we want to, to make uh, them fit in a circumscribed circle. They also start thinking of a straight edge and compass construction that would hit that uh, precisely. But in fact, their, their approach is uh, nearly perfect, uh, as it said uh, in the literature, but in fact, it's not precise. And also, there is a re relatively large, uh, continuously growing uh, literature about the methods to construct this by, uh, by uh, straight edge and compass. And then there has been a mathematician uh, who actually started writing equations, even on the sphere. And uh, Kulaychev has this, uh, by the way, the previous one was an architect. Uh, this, this structure of the three entries is used in architecture in, uh, in many occasions. And uh, Kulaychev uh, is a mathematician and uh, speculates on the difficulty of the equations that he has been writing down, even on a sphere where maybe things could be a bit more manageable. And then uh, comes uh, Gérard Rue, who is uh, a computer scientist, who in the uh, past uh, years became a major expert of Sanskrit as well, and uh, has, uh, is responsible for one of the biggest uh, dictionary of Sanskrit and English, of Sanskrit and French, and uh, has a paper commenting that uh, indeed there is an infinity of solution parameterized by four real numbers. And uh, he also provides this realization in the 80s uh, by computer, which is often used, uh, and the paper actually appears uh, in a volume in 2002, so although this was found some 20 years before. So what are we going to do today is answer this question. First of all, we understood that uh, there are pictures like this, and we want to know which one yield a symbol that fits in a circle. And uh, we, okay, there are equations, but are there solutions? And we just said that uh, this realization says, yes, of course, and, uh, and Kulaychev and Hue have made a rigorous argument in favor of this. And now, now we have pictures of the, like this that uh, depends on eight parameters, as we see. And we would like uh, uh, to know which of them yield a symbol that fits in a circle. And, uh, and actually, how many of them? How big is the variety? What's the dimension of the model like of this? But most of all, this is an easy question, but uh, we would like to know also if we can construct this by, by straight edge and compass. And the sim similar questions are, are the subject of regular mathematical work uh, uh, that I cite here. Now, uh, in this paper that uh, was the beginning of my exchange uh, with André, is a sort of a side paper that uh, probably would not have existed if the pandemics did not arrive and I wanted to explain my son what I was doing uh, and uh, this was the easiest way to do it. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, paper states, well, that there is a four-parameter family of solution that they can be constructed by compass and straight edge and uh, 
and the problem uh, is actually equivalent uh, to a famous problem by Apollonius. The problem of finding a circle that is tangent to three given circles. You take three circles and you want to find the circle or, or the circles that are tangent to the three given circles in the beginning. This is a classical problem, uh, often uh, quoted as uh, one of the beginning moments of algebraic geometry, and we're going to get back to it in the last part of the talk. Uh, maybe, I don't know exactly what, what uh, is your reaction to what I'm doing now, and maybe you, you are, uh, you're a bit surprised or want to protest. So this is your moment. Also, you may wonder if it's possible that there are many solutions. This is something that I've been asked very often, but not by mathematicians, usually by people on the road. They say, well, you know, how, how can there be more than one solution? Just, just to answer this question, here there are two perfectly concurrent three answers, but clearly different ones, because in this example, this vertex is not touching the circle. In this other example, it does. So just to give a, a clear realization of the fact that there are solutions, and there are many of them. There is a, at least a one-parameter family of solutions. In fact, uh, we can uh, heuristically argue that there is clearly a four-dimensional model of space, but uh, the argument is actually heuristic. We said that we started from this drawing, and then, of course, up to rescaling and translating, we can reduce the dimension by two, and then imposing that uh, the two circles circumscribed to the biggest triangles are the same means imposing that their center it at the same height and the radius is the same height. So if everything goes well, there should be a four-dimensional model of space. Uh, another thing is we would like to actually draw them with compass and straight edge. And this is another moment in which uh, I, you know, I came from very far and uh, to here to Santiago and I, I didn't know how, what the public was and I, and I know that uh, many times people say, well, of course, it's constructible by compass and straight edge. Everything is constructible by compass and straight edge. So let me just uh, do this thing of reminding that uh, not many things are constructible by compass and straight edge. I mean, there is this, this major theorem by Gauss that we quote as Gauss of Ansel because it's also of Ansel, which because it's also partly proven by Ansel in one direction. And uh, it says simply that. Uh, a polygonal with n sides can be constructed, uh, let's assume that n is prime, well then, uh, uh, then uh, n should uh, be of this form. Oops, sorry. I mean uh, n should be one of this power of two that have an exponent that is a, a power of two in turn. Or if you prefer, you can start from two and then uh, take a power of this number by two, you get four. Take a power of uh, this number by two, and uh, you get 16. Take a power of this number by two, you get uh, whatever you get. And here you get another big number. But, uh, okay, so these powers of two are exactly those that can be written like this, with, by a little argument. And if you add one, you get all the all, all the so-called Fermat prime numbers. And uh, I should, should be able to know this number. I mean, you know this number. Uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> but it does, it is, this is just to say that there are five prime numbers that, are, uh, that, uh, that uh, can be constructed. And uh, I mean by this that uh, there is a perfect uh, solution to the problem of constructing a pentagon, a, uh, a uh, heptadodecagon, and so on and so forth. And of course, once you can do this, you can also construct uh, the multiples, mutual multiples, where, where each prime number occurs only once. But okay, so if you, if you talk, to, uh, talk to a friend, and he told me, of course you can construct the heptagon, there is uh, plenty of constructions on the web, and I had to show him that uh, all these constructions that we find on the web are clearly uh, not precise. I mean, I, I'm sorry for, for saying this loud and, and clear, but uh, th it, this should be said somewhere. Because it's, it, it, it's so easy to find the Aptagon's construction on the web, so let's, let's move on. So now we're going to try and understand what, where this fits, whether this fits among this series of constructible numbers 
or where this polygon fits in this other category. This has to do with conics, and uh, we're going to discover it in a minute. But okay, so first of all, suppose that you don't want to construct it by compass and, uh, and straight edge, but you just want to, to get a, a, re a representation which is at least approximate, like probably these other people that I've quoted have done. Then uh, you can, uh, you can uh, relax the condition of concurrency on these two vertices and, uh, and make uh, your fifth choice, you have four choices here, your fifth choice, you let it move. And then you stop it right when it, it provides the right concurrency. So what I'm doing here in, uh, in, uh, in uh, simple terms is I'm trying to construct this the way I, I, I when I'm at home, uh, I, I construct, uh, I put the shelves in, in my, on my wall, right? So I use this, uh, this thing, I don't know how you, in Italy we call it the bubble. I don't know how you say that, but anyhow, this carpenter's level is what allows me to do this. And uh, if, you, if you want to do it more practically, instead of the carpenter's level, that you need to stop here to get the right Sriantra, um, and this of course provides a simple answer to the existence of a four parameter space of solutions, you just have to stop where this point yields a horizontal line. But okay, so one other way to construct it, if you want to fix the, the shells in your house, you can use a plow. I mean, these this, this instruments that serve to, to cultivate the ground, right? So this is uh, pulled by two oxen, and you have this plow. You see, I use this plow to, to I guide this plow, plow to this point. This is similar in spirit, and what it does, it just stops precisely on this horizontal line right where I want. This is just a constructive method for determining this point in which I can put my shells. Okay, so I do this through the three yantra. I put the oxen there, I put the plow, and then let it go. And of course, then the, answer, the question is, can I, can I, can I, can I determine this line? And, uh, and that's all I need to construct this three yantra. I mean, since no mathematics, well, these this tools of conics were not used so far. Okay, so this is not a line. You may think that this is not a line just because this is bending, but in fact, it's not a line at all, as you can see in a minute. The oxen are pulling the plow, and uh, their, the intersection point of this is describing a conic. Okay, so now, constructing this triantra is just a matter of intersecting this conic with this horizontal line. And so, starting from here, we, are, we go back to the theorem of Gauss and know that we can construct it. It's a degree two problem. There is no, prob no way we're not going to be able to construct it. Notice that the theorem of Gauss says that we can construct it, but before someone came and constructed a, po a polygon of uh, 257 sides, there was, there was that some time passed, right? And even for the other number there, some time had to, had to pass. So, so, but this simple, this theorem, uh, this problem seemed to be much more uh, widely treated, uh, intersecting a conic through five points and the line. Uh, so now we're coming to the 19th century algebraic geometers. Uh, uh, this uh, treatment uh, of Cremona is uh, something I want to refer to because also it uh, allows us, uh, it quotes all the uh, previous work. This, this is, these are problems that at that stage were widely known and uh, completely elucidated. So, so the problem is this. As you can see, if, if, you, if, we can, if we say first that this line is a degree two curve, and it's not very difficult to know that these five points are, are actually points belonging to this for some reasons. For, by the definition, for instance, uh, since these uh, two oxen were moving along these two lines, 
Of course, the point of intersection of two lines should be a point through which the conic should pass, and the others are a similar argument, uh, which uh, I won't, don't want to detail, but there is this really an easy exercise. So, uh, so we are indeed in the context of conics, and to make this simpler, I would like to work with an ellipsis instead of a, of a hyperbole, just because it's the same problem. What are conics? Conics are, are should be things that everybody speaks of, just like lines. Indeed, we, we, we throw things and they follow conics. We, the planets follow conics. So uh, conics are determines one, determined once we fix five points, just like lines are determined once you fix two points, uh, as long as you don't fix two coinciding points. So if you fix four po five points, a conic is determined. If you fix four points, you have what we call a pencil of con conics. And uh, I mean, pencil is, is the word we use in French is probably is probably uh, pinceau, which is a, more of a brush of conics, which gives more the idea of what we're speaking about. Anyhow, conics all belong to this family of sections that you can make of this cone. Uh, if you section it vertically, you get hyperbola. If you section it horizontally, you get. Uh, Circles, if you section it diagonally following this line, then you get parabola. And if you take all the other way to section it, you get all the ellipses. And uh, now, so the, the question comes to this. And this is going to be an extremely elementary answer. I'm going to, to intersect the only conic that goes to these five points with this line. I take two of them. This and this seems to be well placed. And I project the three remaining one on the line. Whether I project it through via this or via this, I get a three different, two different set of three points. So here I do it. You see, uh, the blue line and the, and the sort of orange line project these this two points. And these two points that get simultaneously projected are considered to be dual. And the point we're looking for are the points of collision of this linear system on this conic. We're looking for the points where this linear system of points collide. Then we have found the intersection. OK, this is not yet uh, very reassuring, because we do not have any instrument to draw this ellipsis. So uh, although this is a very nice conceptual way to no do this, we do not have a compass for this. But OK, so the idea is to project all this from the line to a circle, a nearby circle. Take any circle. Take any point of an, on it and project from the line on this circle. And uh, again, this linear system on the conic that has two points that collide precisely when the conic meets the line, well, whenever they collide on the ellipsis, they also collide on the circle. And those are the points we are looking for. Then we can reproject them back. And uh, OK, so now the last uh, trick that is used is uh, uh, in this treatment of Luigi Cremona is, uh, is, uh, is, to, is to use this Pascal exa uh, hexagram. So let, let, me, let me just draw it here. Uh, Pascal, at the age of 12, noticed that uh, if you take a circle and if you take and if you take six points on a circle, well, this works on an ellipsis as well. Take some, some uh, six points, blue and red, say. And then you make, them, uh, uh, you make them play with each other. I mean, you take two here and two here, and you cross like this. And two here and two here, and you cross like this. And two external one and two here, and you cross like this. Now, these three points are aligned, or should be aligned, if this is really a circle, or this is really an ellipsis. And, uh, and the line you get ultimately meets the circle right at the points where the two linear series collide. Then the only thing you have to do is to unproject, project back on, uh, on the initial ellipsis, and you found the intersection by means 
of compass and straight edge line. Okay, so that's the end of the story. We can now draw the Sri Yantra. I just, uh, it just looks a little bit less easy to read, but not dramatically complicated. Let me just, oops. Okay, so it should, so it is so, it is so, pos so much possible to make it that I can do it in some 20 minutes by hand. Um, this thing should also move. If it doesn't, I should go and ask him to do it. Okay. Yeah, maybe they don't move together. But let's, oh, I see, he really doesn't want to move. Well, yeah, it started moving. So here is a story. So we need to find the five spots where, where the ellipsis or the hyperbola goes through. And then, indeed, I didn't wrote a, a, a second circle somewhere because I had already a circle. So I used that one. And I used the, this point to project everything from it. And uh, that was it. And uh, OK, so somewhere in this article of Gupta, it is said that uh, this, these are not symbols that should be I mean, in the tradition, they were not supposed to be written with some uh, technology. So I went as far as I could to, to write it with uh, my hands. By the way, uh, someone asked me seeing this uh, presentation. I had this video, and I showed it to Gérard Huet. And well, we were discussing. He, he told me rightly that I shouldn't use a ruled edge, right? A straight edge should, there is no reason for this straight edge to be ruled. I'm not using it, the fact that. It has marks on it. OK, yeah, then you can, since, since we said that uh, uh, conic pencils uh, are, actually, uh, are actually brushes of pencils, you can also use the brush if you want and, uh, and get uh, to the end of the story. OK, you can even put the lotus. OK, so questions? The question is, earlier when you did this on the non-surface, non the Euclidean surface, but some other purpose, yeah. there was something appearing that looked like those roses. Is, is this like the... Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. Well, nice question. I don't know. Yeah. No, no. You're right. Indeed, I wondered if these lotus, 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 lotus leaves had some prescribed form, but I am not aware of it. So that's the end of the story. But that's not exactly when uh, Andre and I started discussing this. So this is more a 19th century mathematics. And I said that uh, uh, in this paper appearing in uh, in, uh, in 2021, uh, we, we were actually considering a different, a different way to construct this that went back to this Apollonius uh, problem, which I, I, can, I can state again. Apollonius has a, uh, was a, a mathematician of the third century before Christ. And uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, problem, he actually has a treaty, treatment on, uh, on, uh, on conics, so in, in a very modern sense. So you have three circles, and you want to know uh, if there are um, circles that are tangent to, to the three of them. And it doesn't take much to know that uh, this indeed exists. And this, if, you, if you require the circle to be not to contain any of the circles, then there is exactly one. But if you allow for the circle to contain the three others, then there, are, then there is another one. And if you allow one to be excluded, the two to be contained, then you can actually draw a, another circle that maybe gets out of the blackboard and so on and so forth. When, if you allow 
two to be excluded and one to be contained. Oh, wait. Uh, uh, one is contained, right? And uh, one is contained and two are uh, excluded. Well, then you can also do that, this, in, uh, in a way. So, so I, we did contain two. So we have this, this eight answers here. So the way you contain one and two are excluded. Okay, so this is by combinatorics, is, is num, num, the answer is eight circles. So what does this have to do? Well, similarly to the problem uh, of, uh, of, uh, of describing the Sri Yantra with the conics, you can get a, a solution by, by identifying the only or, well, some circle that is tangent to this line, this circle, and passes through this point. And uh, once you do this, this is the circle you look for, and then you can paint uh, the Sri Yantra. But uh, uh, one of observation, it's similar to this previous observation that I made. I needed to intersect this conic with this line, but there are two intersections. And similarly, there are two, several solutions of the Apollonius problem. And there are two circles that are tangent to this given circle, this line, and pass to this. And one of the circles is, is very obvious, and the other is much less obvious. But okay, so the, the answer I'm trying to address here, the question I'm trying to address here, is whether uh, the other circle is also going to yield some uh, diagram. And what is this diagram coming to have to do with our previous one? Okay, so this seems to me a good spot to speak about spin curves, as I, as I mentioned in the abstract. Let's see what happens here. Uh, okay, so... As I said, four points determine an Apollonius problem. You solve this problem in a way, you get this uh, uh, series of circles and triangles, which you can sort of bend like in an accordion to get the diagram that you wanted. But uh, if you start from an Apollonius problem, you can have, have more than one solution. And trust me, you can have more than one series of triangles. And then if you just uh, let a computer follow the instructions, you, you, get, you get another diagram, which doesn't actually seem to be very nice to look at, but is another diagram. And, uh, and so what is this uh, telling us? To begin with, let us uh, remember that we didn't actually get a single diagram, we got an infin in a variety of diagrams. So this is a locus within a moduli space. So uh, just to make it clear, here I, I make it move in all possible ways. You notice that if I move it too much, it gets, goes a little bit away from, uh, from the right range and gets all out of uh, the right, uh, the right uh, concurrencies. But uh, the picture I have is the following. And that's the last picture I'm, I'm going to show on the blackboard. There, is a, there are two books, uh, one by Harris and uh, Eisenbud, but what I'm going to refer to is the work of uh, Joe Harris. In all, this, uh, in all this treatment, the problem of solving the Apollonius problem is described in this way. There is a modular space of curves. Whenever you trace these three, three circles, you are actually determining an algebraic curve of some genus. Uh, sometimes an algebraic curve which is singular, in fact it is the case, but you are on a moduli space of curves. Placing the circles means pointing somewhere in the moduli space of curves. And uh, solving the Apollonius problem means picking up a point in a, in a, in a cover of the moduli space of curves, which 
is a multiple sheeted cover, a finite cover, ramified somewhere. It is ramified precisely at those points that you know. For instance, you all know that there, are only, there is only one single circle that passes through three points. These are the generate circles, and of course there is a unique point going through them. So that's uh, one of those ramification points that you see here. Nevertheless, this model A space is connected. It's a model A space uh, of curves equipped with a line bundle or a vector bundles of dimension two, a complex line bundles. In real, it's a two-dimensional vector bundle, whose uh, second uh, tensor power is isomorphic to the canonical bundle, the cotangent bundle, say. So this is a spin structure, and the spin structure um, have uh, either an odd number of sections or an even number of sections. So the model space of all spin structure is not connected, but the model space of odd spin structures is connected. And this uh, means that the two solutions that we have seen properly deformed can be deformed one into the other. So that's one way of solving these two diagrams that I have placed before on the blackboard. One way of, uh, of understanding why we found these two solutions, and in fact that my moving, the one that we saw could move in, in many directions, uh, one can get to this one. So uh, the two solutions are points of two modular spaces. This is a ramified cover of the modular space of curves. One is the modular space of curves. The other is the modular space of odd spin curves. These roots of the canonical. And this interpretation is due to Joe Harris in this paper, which is a beautiful and rather difficult paper to read, uh, which interpret the, interprets the Apollonius problem in terms of roots of the canonical bundle, which actually possess a section and therefore they're odd. I don't want to, to, to insist too much on this fact, but uh, in this specific case, either there is a section or there isn't. And there, that, that's why the parity distinguishes precisely the one we want, the one that have sections, the one that admit a circle tangent to all the three circles. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so, so the paper of Joe Harris tells you exactly everything you want to know about the automorphism group on the, on the, on the odd uh, spin structure. Uh, but if the question concerns only those that yield a realization in terms of the striantra, then uh, it's hard to make sense of the questions because uh, either we admit a huge number of, uh, of striantra that look uh, much more uglier than this one, I'm speaking by this of triangles that are not even having an inside, they only are uh, meant to have an outside, they, they, they go outside the circle. And then uh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to speak about. And uh, so on the other hand, we can get back to our well-behaved striantra and realize that then in that case, this, the space is pretty dull, it's contractible, and uh, no, not much monodromy to be made, but okay, so let's get back to, I mean, we're here also to speak about some, uh, some, uh, some geometry that uh, has a sort of natural status, and I think that working on the complex numbers makes much more sense, so then the answer to your question is, is really in this paper. So curves is where appearing where those conics, right? Yeah. Yeah, how can, how can that be? I mean, uh, yeah, there is something to be, made, to be detailed, right? You want to know how to relate this line bundle to actually, uh, to actually a circle that is tangent to the three points, and I'm not going to take an hour to do this, but I expected this question, so I, I will say something about that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very important. I mean, uh, it's very important, very fascinating. So you have to accept, I, I've, I've, thought, I've thought of this question, but uh, I also... I also thought that uh, I cannot explain every step of, of the story, but 
to begin with, we said uh, you, you seem to have accepted that uh, this, this three circles are, um, are three conics. Three. Oh, right. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. But uh, no, no. I'm, I'm now speaking about this one. But if you want, I can speak also about that other one. Uh, this, is three conics, not one. this is three conics. I agree with you. Uh, OK, so yeah, OK. So now you're even more confused, right? Um, so these are three conics. What, what kind of conics give circles? So that's the first question. Uh, we said that we need to fix uh, uh, five points to get a conic. Indeed, for circles, you only need three points. Why is that? Well, if you are in the, in the project, two-dimensional projective space, uh, the circles are precisely the one that uh, pass to two, through two fixed points at infinity, which we use usually mm, the term in fix to, for the sake of clarity. So, so you should imagine this as, a, as, a, as three conics, all of them passing to these points at infinity. So they meet like the axis of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the coordinates. So this is a pretty singular curves, OK? And um, also, they also meet inside the complex plane. So rather than describing like that, them like that, we should probably describe them in this way. Second, uh, second uh, we have a, a way of speaking of bundles in terms of divisors, which are points on the curve. And that's, again, a big step. I mean, this is a first-gen class that determines the divisor. That's fine. And uh, uh, now we're looking for not a bundle, therefore, but we're looking for some points on these curves, two for each, for each uh, sorry, let's put them here, two for each, for each, uh, for each, uh, for each uh, circle. But so that, uh, oh, actually, wait. So any circle meet the other circles in two points. And uh, you have to convince yourself here, I'm skipping the details, that uh, this is going to give you the canonical series of this curve, the canonical bundle of the singular curve. Let's admit that. And uh, now we are looking for a divisor such that uh, twice itself is going to give you the canonical bundle. Twice itself is going to give you some divisor linearly equivalent to this. And therefore, uh, the only way that can happen is by having double points on each, the canonical ident identifying uh, twice, twice, and twice these points. And uh, so that's how, the way it goes. Uh, thank you. Any further, further questions? Good. All right, then I have a soft question. So uh, you come from algebraic geometry. How come you got interested in the Sri Dianto? Uh, how come? Oh, yes, sure. So there is a book uh, by uh, Jung that has this cover. And I discovered the same, uh, uh, um, that the cover was not chosen by Jung. I think it's the editor choosing it. Uh, this, this, this story is told in exactly the same way by, by Hue. He, he has a book in his hands, and he says, uh, sometimes he even remarks that sometimes this picture is, is upside down. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, you can end up observing this picture uh, in many contexts. Uh, then um, then, uh, then uh, it takes some time to understand there is a problem there. But OK, so that's, uh, that's how I got, uh, I, got, uh, I got carried into this. Yeah. Very so, nice. Sorry. <laughs> All right, well, we first. Oh, could you go back to the, to the, to the time? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, well, you mentioned that it's impossible to bring them on the, on the plane. Ah, I haven't, haven't uh, a, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, if we, okay, so before the tiling on the curved space, we can go about it this way. So what happens there, as you can see, the angle of the, 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 the isosceles triangle that I'm tracing get, more and more obtuse, in a way, right? And, uh, and so, I don't know if this is a correct argument, but I think that eventually this was, is going gonna, is gonna to flatten. Um, um, yeah. And then, uh, speaking about this, well, I need something curved in that way, something that bounds it in this sense, but also that allows us to, to go like the lotus as a, as a, 
as has been said. And uh, yeah, so I have no educated guess. The reason why this picture is here is for you to follow me through a much, uh, for, for me not to uh, um, bore you with a list of definition. I wanted to give you something that moves and seemed nice uh, enough to navigate through. Uh, so this was the idea. If I did that, you will understand the Sriantra in a sort of dynamic way and then maybe get some ideas that will, yeah. But I agree now that I've been talking about this to Andre, that he, he's asking me about this tiling. There should be some, maybe some interesting property. I, <laughs> Sebastian, you're, you're asked, what is your... <laughs> I cannot really say, um, I mean, I don't really understand the construction completely, but um, it seems that if you have positive curvature, you can make this thing uh, forever, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's anything interesting from the symbolic point of view. I'd have to take a look at it. At it. Thank you, anyhow. Right. <laughs> uh, are there any further questions from the audience? If not, let us thank uh, Alessandro again. Thank you very much.